Hello, everybody, and welcome back into another season preview show here at the Hockey Writers Podcast. And we are moving along really quickly here. Uh, we're about almost halfway through the teams, and we've got another one here, Boston Bruins. Um, Scott Roach is here to uh, talk about that. He covers the Bruins extensively. Also got my co-host, Kyle Knopp. Uh, thanks, Scott, for coming on the show and uh, lending your expertise. Uh, guys, thank you for having me. All right. I'm excited to have well, you. Yeah, we're, we're excited to have you on. Uh, like we, you know, meeting a lot of people. But uh, I've I had uh, Scott on the playoff preview show, so yep. we've talked uh, about the Bruins before. But uh, we're going to talk about them again and uh, talk about the new season coming up and quite a few changes uh, for the Bruins. They had a new coach, uh, got some players coming back. That you know, one guy that that uh, left for a season and now back. Um, lots of injuries to start the season too. So lots to talk about. So let's start with the only new addition, that really major new addition that they got in Pavel Zaka. So let's talk about him first, Scott. And what do you expect from him coming from the New Jersey Devils um, for Eric Halla? Um, what do you expect from him this season? Well, he's someone who's been on Don Sweeney's radar the last couple trade deadlines, uh, but New Jersey never moved him. Um, Getting him was not a surprise because uh, I know how you, we, it's widely known how well Sweeney likes him. Um, he's a part of that 2015 draft, that famous 2015 draft here in Boston. Mm. Um, he was the sixth pick of that draft. Um, I think the expectations is he, he, the talents there. I don't know if he's totally put it all together yet in New Jersey. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And I'm thinking maybe the change of scenery coming up here. Jim Montgomery, the new coach, has already kind of leaked out what he's thinking with the top six without Brad Marchand. And it sounds like Pavel Zakas might get a chance up not only in the top six, but maybe in the top line with Patrice Bergeron. So playing with a Patrice Bergeron can only help him get going with a new team and a new city and a new start. Absolutely. And I remember I watched Zaka up in his junior days uh, where I was working with the Saginaw Spirit and he was with uh, Sarnia, I believe, the Sarnia Sting at the time. And mm -hmm. I mean, he used to have a cannon of a shot uh, as a 16, 17 year old. Um, and it just it seems like he never really developed into that player that they expected him to be. So or New Jersey expect him to be. So it'll be ex exciting to see him uh, in a new new surroundings. And hopefully he can really take off and, and hit that ceiling that we all thought he would reach. All right, well, let's talk about a guy that's toward the end of his career, uh, one that took a year off pretty much to play back in his home country and, and represent his country at the Olympics. But that's David Krejci. So is he going to be the same player that left in 2020, 2021, or will he be better or worse after his year overseas? Well, for the Bruins, I could think they want him to be just as good, if not better than he was in 2021. Um, <laughs> him coming back is not really a surprise. I think, and I think we're going to talk about it later, the whole, the way the whole off season unfolded after the playoff elimination and the moves that were made and kind of led to this. Um, they're going to need him to be the David Krejci he was back when he left. When he, mm -hmm. when the Bruins got Taylor Hall at the 2021 trade deadline, Krejci was just sputtering along on the second line. And Hall, Krejci, and Craig Smith really took off. And David mm -hmm. Krejci became a different player those last 15, 16 regular season games in the playoffs. They're going to need that from him right from the go because I did a piece yesterday – well, actually, I did a piece. Yeah, I did. They did not get young at center. The one yeah. thing the Bruins need to do this season, amongst some big things, get young at center. And somehow, some way, Don Sweeney managed to get older by bringing this guy. <laughs> I mean, yeah. he takes him out of the collar out of the second line, trades him, and brings him, brings in 36 year old David Krejci, brings yeah. 32 year old Chris Bergeron back. So, yeah. It's only so long that those guys are going to be able to play at the top for you. And I, and I think if the Bruins are going to have survive the first two months they're going to need the 2021 version of preachy <laughs> at least at the very least right yeah i uh, well let's keep on the crazy talk you talk about taylor hall um do you anticipate them reigniting that chemistry i mean briefly they look like really good together do you see them kind of playing i mean hall had a pretty good season last year too so what do you think about that that duo going in taylor hall did have a pretty good year in 
when Brad Marchand was suspended and injured during the year, when he went up on the first line with Patrice Bergeron, he, he really played well. Not that he didn't play well with Parsonak and Haller on the second line after that. I think the second line of Taylor Hall, David Krejci, David Parsonak, which Montgomery again has hinted at that he wants to do. I think, I think that could be a solid second line and really, I think you're going to see if David Krejci is as motivated as people think he's going to be, being able mm-hmm. to finally play with David Pasternak and have Taylor Hall on the left side, two good goal scorers and consistent players. I, I think that's only going to help. And I, and with Brad Marsh on out, Taylor Hall has to mm-hmm. pick up the slack offensively somehow, some way, if they're going to stay above water in the first two months. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. All right, so we kind of saw this happen last year with Vladimir Tarasenko in St. Louis where he had a trade request out there, rescinded it, and then ended up having a fantastic season. Now in Boston, Jake DeBrusque kind of went through this last year, had a trade request, has since rescinded it. So what are your expectations for him coming into this season? I think you're going to see a player playing with a lot less pressure on his shoulders and someone watching over him. It's funny, today he met with the media in Boston and said that um, the decision to move on from Bruce Cassidy had no factor into his rescinding the trade request. Okay, if you believe that, then you can believe it. Because I <laughs> I mean, he's not going to come out and say, yes, that's why I get it. But, but I think that the whole purpose from what you've been, if you put two and two together was Bruce Cassidy and him did not match... Bruce Cassidy constantly called him out in the media. And I think the last straw was the healthy scratch against Vancouver right after Thanksgiving last year. So mm-hmm. I think you're going to get a look what, look what he did when he went up with Bergeron and Marshawn last year. Mm-hmm. He'd be a different player ended up with over 25 goals, a second 20 goal season. Yeah. I think you're going to see a different player playing with a lot less pressure on him. And I, there's no reason why he can't be at least a 20 goal scorer. Mm again yeah yeah i i i agree with that too i think uh, he looked really good um towards the end of the season there and yeah new coach uh, i think is going to really help him out for sure well let's talk about some guys that he's probably one of these guys that's going to answer this question but you know we mentioned brad marchand gonna be out until december um huge part of the boston bruins for the last what since he came into the league um, what do you, who do you expect to step up the most or who do you want to step up the most with, uh, him being gone? To- well, I think who has to is, has, has to be Taylor Hall. Mm-hmm. I think it, yeah, I think David, you're going to get what you get from David Pasternak. I think Jake DeBrus will play motivated, but I think it all really, a lot of the weight on the shoulder is going to be on Taylor Hall because if he can't produce, I think that's going to in the expectations for Pavel Zaka. I don't think he's going to come in and, and he's not expected to come in and replace Brad Marsh on production and stuff like that. But Taylor Hall is going to be the one I think in that top six, that's going to have to pick up the slack and produce more than he did last year, especially in the first couple of months. Cause you know what you're going to get from Pasternak, the brusque you hope stays hot Bergeron and Krejci. You just hope they stay healthy and play the way they've been playing. And I think the key part of the top six and the one who needs to produce and should produce is Hall. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. I, th- I think you're absolutely right. I think he's got the biggest chip on his shoulder uh, heading into the season, especially mm-hmm. filling that role for Marshawn. All right. Well, let's take a look at this forward group as a whole. Uh, and I know they're missing one of their key pieces in Marshawn, uh, but even without him, how do you feel this Boston Bruins team matches up with the other teams? Uh, sorry, the forwards from the Boston Bruins teams match matches up with other forwards from other teams in the Atlantic. Well, I mean, you look at Tampa Bay. I mean, they set the standard the last couple of years. I mean, when they won their cups, what were they three lines deep at least? Oh, absolutely. Mm. Yeah. And, I mean, and you look at the Panthers the last couple of years and the Maple Leafs are a wagon up front. I, I think they may be the fourth best line in that, in that division, but I'm not putting anything past the Ottawa Senators. Yeah. Without mm. shot. With Marchand, they're a two-line team. Without him, I mean, they're a five-player top five, <laughs> top five, unless Zaka can come in and play well. I think their problem is when they're healthy, they're still a two-line team. I think yeah. that 
depth over time is going to wear down on them and the lack of production will catch up with them as it has in past years. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. And we were uh, recently talking with the Ottawa senators and, and, you know, their contributor and man, they got a lot of depth this season. So mm. uh, that's something that, yeah, you got to have for a Stanley cup contender. you got to have that depth. Like you said, Tampa Bay, their third line carried them through the playoffs in 2020, 2021. Yeah. Oh, I, I definitely agree with that too. I think Boston without Marchand is, yeah, like you say, a five player type up, up front. So they're going to need some contributions from other guys to, uh, <laughs> to, to kind of hope that they can, uh, you know, stay above water until that happens. Yeah. But I mean, injuries don't, aren't only happening at the forward group more on the defense <laughs> so you got two guys that are out november december so matt grizzlick out until november charlie mcavoy till december mm-hmm. so who's going to need to step up to keep them the blue line above water because they really only have one pairing that's going to be really good um and those are two guys that play a ton of minutes so what do you think uh, you, you're talking about hampus lindholm and brandon carlo yeah and, and, um, <laughs> It's funny, Hampus Lindholm said today in his media availability that he would not be opposed to picking up 25 to 30 minutes a night playing McAvoy's amount of time a night. Mm -hmm. Um, That might be risky for someone who came over here last year and missed a lot of time at the end of the regular season with an injury Mm -hmm. and then was out of the middle of the series against Carolina with another injury. But I, I think the scary part is Brandon Carlo plays well in flashes. He's not consistent. He, he's a stay at home defenseman. He had a lot of turn, has lots of turnovers in his own end, fails to clear pucks. I mean, he's a great penalty killer, but I think that's who you have to go with with your top pairing. Hampus Lindholm has been showing he's consistent, but Brandon Carlo would scare me being consistent for two months on that top pairing. And I just, the depth down below after them is really drops off, really drops off in trust and faith in some of them. (laughs) <laughs> you, so you mentioned not having any confidence in Lindholm and Carlo uh, playing in that top pairing and that the, everything drops off from that. Mm-hmm. So who are those next two pairings that are going to take over the Lindholm and Carlo minutes after Lindholm and Carlo take over the Grizzly and McAvoy minutes? Well, it's talent wise. It's not a deep group. And I think it's the weakest group by far on their roster. You're looking at Derek Forward on the left side and Connor Clifton on the right. And then when you get to a third pairing, you're probably looking at Mike Riley and Jakob Zaboro having to go to his offside from the left to the right to play those minutes on the bottom pairing. So it's not an ideal situation for um, Jim Montgomery to have coming in. Mm -hmm. But if you look at the prospects pool down below, there aren't really many other options. (laughs) Yeah. 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 Don Don Sweeney's drafting has kind of been – pointed out as long as it has, but it's finally catching up with them, not only up front and center, but on defense. I mean, they got some guys that are peanuts and they just <laughs> can't stand. They can't withstand the grind of an NHL season. Yeah. 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 It's true though. It, it is a grind. And if you're not prepared for it, that you, you're going to hurt the team. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the defensive group, I mean, that top pairing is okay. I mean, it's not ideal to be a top pairing. Um <laughs> And, you know, you get into that November, you know, I always say where, where you are around American Thanksgiving, end of November is where you're probably going to end up. If you're not in the playoffs, you're probably not making it or you're going to have a hard time. So um, having both of them out until after that, I, I don't know. It's going to be interesting to see where they are at that point, because I don't know if them coming back, um, you know, in December, I mean, Matt Grizzlick is coming back before that, apparently. So it's going to be tough. So yeah. let's, let's talk about how they match up then. It doesn't sound good. Um, <laughs> how do they match up in this division? Are they towards that right at the bottom without these guys? Oh, I, I would say they're, they're definitely in the bottom half. I think a lot of nights last year, they get pushed around, even with McAvoy and Grizzly out there. And Grizzly's not big either, but he's tough. Yeah. He'll go to the yeah. boards, he'll battle in the corners, a battle in front of the net. He'll stand up to anybody. But I just, I just think that they're just, it's funny. I was looking at it the other day and I'm saying to myself, if I'm lining up to play them on a, as a forward group and on the other team, who am I scared of? Who am I trying to avoid? And there's really no one there other than maybe like Carlo and forward penalty killing is probably their best attribute, but five on five, 
who am I going against on their three pairings that I'm going to be concerned about throwing someone over the lines on the boards to play against? And I, I don't think it's there. I think, like I said before, by far, that's the weakest position they have. Yeah. That's, I mean, I think you're right. I think without those two guys to start the season is bad enough, but then they just don't have the depth to, to even rely on anyone to, to fill in, even if it were like three or four guys to fill in for those two guys, they just don't have that. Uh, so it'll be interesting. And I think one of the main key storylines to keep an eye on for the Boston Bruins, at least at the beginning of the season. And I, All right, I think well, Don Sweeney did himself no favors by being a cap team and going on that spending spree last summer, yeah, which yeah. really handcuffed him and really could not. I mean, John Klingberg would have been a nice addition, but you don't have the cap room to add him. You yeah. Know? <laughs> you add him at the, at the top there to begin the year, then figure out what you're going to do. It doesn't sound like he's going to use the long-term injury stuff. So I, he, he's just completely mismanaged this cap. And really, they're in the yeah. position they're in because of that. Yeah, and that's – tell you what, like that can come back and burn them in the future too. Like mm-hmm. uh, set them up yeah. for, you know, for just tough road down, you know, in the next two, three years. So uh, you're absolutely right that that cap mismanagement is a big part of why there's a lack of death back there. Mm-hmm. All right. Well, let's move over to goaltending. Uh, the starter, Jeremy Swayman, only going into his second full season in the NHL. What are your expectations for this young man as he heads into his sophomore season? I expect him to pick up where he left off last year. I mean, some goalies come in this league and it's a feeling out process and it's sometimes like a deer in the headlights look. And mm-hmm. yep, he just didn't have it. That first 20, 20 21 season – the 56 game season, he just came in when Rask got hurt and Halak got hurt and played those 10 games, went seven and three and just played freely, but showed so much confidence with himself in himself. And he kind of picked up where he left off last year. One of my bold predictions was last year was he's going to win 20 plus games. And I had a lot of people responding to me telling me I'm crazy. But <laughs> he won 23 games yeah. and he really with a lot of confidence, especially at the end of the year. So I expect him to come in and play the way he did last year. Now, granted, him and Linus Allmark, they're going to see a lot of rubber the first couple of months. So <laughs> oh, it's like gonna you be just said. Of, it's going to be a thing of stamina, too. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and like you just said, they're at the that defense is at the bottom of the division. So, yeah, that's going to lead to a lot of shots. But I'll tell you what, I, I loved Swayman last year. Um, I actually – I picked uh, Boston in that first round of the playoffs thinking Swayman was going to be their starter before I had realized uh, he was out with that injury. And I think that would have been a huge difference had he been in that uh, from the get uh, in that series. And goaltender was the least of their problems in that series. (laughs) Exactly. Yeah. They're having too many defensive breakdowns. That's also true. Swayman and Almack got them to a seventh game was pretty remarkable within itself. Yeah, yeah, I mean, Allmark sure. played out of his mind for sure, but I, I had a ton of confidence in Swayman heading in. I think they wouldn't even gone seven. I think Boston could have stole a few more, but mm-hmm. um, I mean, they still, you know, Allmark played great. And, uh, you know, so yeah, Matt, I think you have a question <laughs> to follow up with that. Well, we mentioned his name twice now, uh, Linus <laughs> Allmark. I, everyone's anticipating Jeremy Swayman to be the starter I, to come into the season, but they're starting as the tandem again. This coming, you know, last season they started as a tandem. Tuka Rask came in briefly and then retired officially. So he played one game, right? Played one game and then <laughs> he retired. Um, so they're tandem again. Do you see Swayman or Allmark kind of running away with the starter's job? Are they going to be more of a 1A, 1B? I think they're going to split to begin the year, kind of like they did last year. Um, the thing Almack struggled in, in, pre, in the preseason, in the training camp, in, early in the season, but got better as the season went along, got more mm-hmm. comfortable. The one thing that can, would concern me with Linus Almack is when he was with Buffalo, he had his ups and downs, but he had more downs and ups. He was injured. He was injured yeah. a lot. And I think his health is going to be a big part of it. He stayed relatively healthy last year. And I think maybe splitting time with Swayman helped that. And I think it will at the beginning of the year this year because, again, after those two, Keith Kincaid's their third goalie. Mm-hmm. And they signed him this year. So after these two, there's no goalie depth really either. But I think eventually Jeremy Swayman will probably outplay him and get the majority of the stats toward the end of the year and um, end up playing more games in Omak. 
Hmm. Yeah, I, I see that as well. I think this is going to end up being Swayman's team. Uh, mm -hmm. But you, like you said, when healthy, Allmark is a solid backup. And, you know, Buffalo, I think everyone, especially goaltenders, have up and downs, <laughs> more downs and ups in Buffalo. Yeah. But that's a, that's that's a whole nother podcast story there. So, all right. Well, when healthy, a healthy Allmark and Swayman are in the lineup, how does this goaltending matchup with the other teams in the Atlantic? Well, obviously, Andre Vasilevsky is a different animal up down there in Tampa. <laughs> I mean, he's obviously the the number one. But um, I think when they're playing as well, look at they went on that run in the second half of last year. Yeah. They won a lot of two to one, three to two games in a lot of games and overtimes and shootouts, mainly because of their goaltending. Hmm. One, you can look at the record they had. A lot of it was with the puck being stopped. It wasn't with the hmm. puck going in the net down the other end. It was the puck being stopped. And I think they, I think they're in the top third of the Atlantic hmm. with their goaltending tandem compared to the other teams right now. Yeah. But it's like I said, it's out in front of them. That's yeah. ultimately be the bigger issues. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> you could you have the best going tandem you want, but if you're giving up 60, 70 shots a game and can't clear the puck, <laughs> it's not going to look pretty. <laughs> not every, every goal he can, can. The best goal. <laughs> I mean, like I you say, said, I was... wonder what Martin Brodeur would be in, in the bad team. Right. Yeah. Right. <laughs> and like Scott said, you know, it wasn't their goaltending in the playoffs. That was their problem last year. Yeah. It was, you know, not, not getting the puck out of their own zone and, and taking advantage of, you know, the offensive side. So. Yeah. I think goal, like you say, goaltending is probably again, the least of their worries going into this season. I think. <laughs> Agreed. Agreed. They have to worry about them, which actually, Sorry to cut you off there, Matt, but that's a surprise kind of from last year when, you know, Tuka Rask was the big question mark. And then everyone yeah. was like, well, what do they have after Rask? And now it's like, well, they're okay at goaltending. What's in front of them? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, that's very true. Well, let's talk about, we've mentioned his name a couple of times already, but uh, they got a new coach. Uh, taking over from Bruce Cassidy is Jim Montgomery uh, coming from the he previously coached the Dallas Stars, what do you think about him coming into Boston? Uh, what type of changes do you see coming uh, with him behind the bench? I mean, this is the first time they have a new coach since 2016. I think it's going to be a totally different um, approach than what they had the last few years with Bruce Cassidy. Uh, I think Jim Montgomery is more of a player's coach, and it's going to be more kept inside behind closed doors. Bruce Cassidy took everything out to his press post game press conferences, which mm. was great for content. <laughs> but I think you saw the Jake DeBrus situation we mentioned earlier, kind of war on him when he ever he goes, he goes out to face the media and your coach says this, your coach says that. I think it's going to be more of a um, quiet, more in the room, and I think it's going to be a different structure. Um, I think they're going to play. I think they're going to concentrate more defensively getting the puck out of the zone, playing in transitioning zones. Um, but I do think it's going to be a dip. I think it's going to take a little bit mm -hmm. and it's not ideal missing your two of your top four blue liners and your leading score from last year to inject yeah. everything, into your system and everything yeah. into place. So um, I think it's going to be a learning process on the go for everybody. Absolutely. Absolutely. Whenever you lose your top scorer it, and your two best defensemen, I mean, you're, you're already, you know, back against the wall right from the get. So that'll be interesting yeah. to watch. All right. Well, we're going to move over to our quick fire segment. And uh, this is where we're going to fire some questions at you, Scott. We want your best uh, could be one word answer, or you could have one to two sentences to kind of explain your answer, but we just want a nice little quick answer from you for each of these. So uh, you might've already brought it up, uh, especially in that last answer, but what is the biggest storyline or question mark going into this season? How are they going to do in the first two months without those three players? Are they going to survive in the standings or not? Yeah, that's Absolutely. a bit, yeah. massive that's question. Huge, <laughs> huge question mark. <laughs> All right. Uh, one or two breakout stars for the season? Um, Pavel Zaka. I mean, is he finally going to become a 20-goal scorer? Mm, that's that's probably. what you got to wonder in Taylor Hall. Is he going to be able to pick up the slack? Um, and Jake DeBrusque, is he a 25-year-old <laughs> goal scorer yeah. along that line? There you yeah. Go. No, absolutely. I think you're absolutely right. 
All right. Who is one player that needs a big bounce back from last season? Craig Smith. I mean, you score 20 goals a year in Nashville for five out of nine years, and you, most you get is 16 in Boston. It's got to be Craig Smith with depth scoring. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Especially with all those guys. That, well, not all those guys, but Marchand out. Uh, yeah. If he can um, score some goals too, that'd be good. All right. X factor for next season. Special teams. I mean, are they going to be able to produce on the power play as much as they have before? They kind of sank to the bottom last year. Are they going to be able to get to the top without Marshawn and with Krejci back and the penalty killing? I mean, yeah. that's going to be key. They have to be in the top five in the first part of the year if they're going to survive. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> I love I love that as an X factor. Mm. All right. One rookie or prospect that could surprise and make the roster out of training camp. The easy answer is Fabian Lysel, which everyone yes. wants to hear and hope to happen. But I think it's going to be Jack Studnicker. It's either now or never. The yeah. It's been so long. It's it's either going to be now or never. You got to find out if he's the one for when those guys up top are gone. Yeah, yep. yeah. I, I, I was going to actually ask a specific question about him, so it's good you mentioned him. This. <laughs> <laughs> All right. What other players should fans be watching that we have not mentioned yet? All right. I mentioned them. Already, but I only mentioned him briefly. It's going to be Jakob Zaboro on defense. I mean, he's proven that he can do both left side. He did it in the AHL with Providence, and that's going to be key early in the year is solidifying that third hearing. Mm -hmm. That's yeah, I like that. I like that call up. All right, this one might be a little bit harder because your top scorer is out for the first three months. But <laughs> who is going to lead the team in scoring for forwards? It's got to be Pasternak. You think, right? I mean, he's yeah. usually right behind Marchant and you got to think he's going in the contract situation. He hasn't signed yeah. yet. The motivation's there to do what he can do. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And who will lead the team in scoring for defense? I mean, I could say Charlie McAvoy because it's still limited offensively back there. He might do it when he comes back. <laughs> Maybe Hampus Lindholm getting some first unit power play time can add up some stats. I, I feel like Lindholm kind of needs to have a big offensive year this mm -hmm. year. Yeah, well, especially with those guys out for sure. Yeah, uh, yeah, even more so, yeah. <laughs> if he doesn't, they're going to be in tough. <laughs> All right, one player that could be traded before the trade deadline. Oh, there, there's a handful of candidates that could be. <laughs> but I think um, one of them is Craig Smith, my ex, the one who needs to have the bounce back season because once they're healthy, man, I mean, if they're, if they're struggling, he, he could help a team on the final year of a deal for some yeah. depth school. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. He'd, he'd be a great depth pickup for a team that's trying to make a playoff push. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. All right. Give us one bold prediction or hot take for the 2022-23 season for the Boston Bruins. My bold is Jake DeBrus scoring 30 goals. Mm. All right. It's bound to happen. I mean, he's got 27, 25. He's got to eventually get there with the talent he has, you would think. And he's playing with the perfect top six to get there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 I, I, I could see that happening for sure. All like right, that. this is a big question. Where will the Bruins finish in the standings, and will they make the playoffs? Right now, if I had to uh, guess, they're probably the fourth or fifth, maybe the fifth best team in the Atlantic. Florida, Tampa, Toronto, and I think Ottawa may have passed them right now, especially with all the injuries. Mm. Um, so you're looking, for, you're looking at a wild card spot at best, maybe the eighth spot. Um, I think a lot of people, they still think they're going to hold their head above water and be fine. I think they're going to start slow. And I think that's going to ultimately cost them chasing too many points come March and April. Hmm. That's, I think that's fair. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, unless they can do what Pittsburgh did. I mean, last year, Penguins, like just everyone thought they were going to struggle to be in the season without Crosby and Malkin. And they didn't. <laughs> a yeah. lot of the guys started stepping up, Rodriguez and all those guys. So, I mean, I in, reality, never know. Never know. in reality, you have to think that if they're going to stay above water and get in the playoffs, Allmark and Swayman are going to have to come close to winning the Jennings Trophy. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> you're, I mean, for oh, real, though. For reality. real. Yeah. 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 No, I, I have definitely, to be the goaltending is going to have to be massive mm -hmm. in the first couple of months for sure. Yeah. And you're going to have to, like you said, you're going to have to get a lot of depth scoring too from guys that are, are stepping up and, and filling roles or, you know, finding the back in the net when they're usually not. So uh, I think those are the two, two big factors for the Bruins this season, especially at the first two months. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's going to be huge to watch what happens. <laughs> There's a couple months here for Boston. So, 
All right. Uh, we're going to finish the show off as we usually do on the Hockey Writers Podcast in our article of the day segment. So, Scott, uh, we're not going to pick one, but you're going to give us one from the Boston Bruins writing team. It can be your own. Uh, a lot of people have been doing that. But uh, give us one from the Bruins writing team that people should be checking out. I kind of made reference to it earlier in the uh, discussion, but the big part of this, the big part, of the problem they have now is not only injuries, but the cap mismanagement by Don Sweeney. And I wrote about that, that he's really, there's no one to blame but himself. Yeah. With the money he threw away last year. I mean, paying Nick Felino $3.8 million to be a bottom six forward playing 11, 12 minutes a night. I mean, that's just, <laughs> that's just throw money. And no one will take him. No one's going to yeah. take him from him because they know yeah. you want to get rid of him. Yeah. Um, Linus Allmark's been well, but $5 million for potentially a backup goalie. That's a yeah. lot of money tied up on the bench. Yeah. Especially if Swayman ends up playing more games than he does. So I think the piece I had about a, three or four weeks ago about the cap mismanagement by Sweeney last year and the reason they were a cap team this year and weren't able to add, I, I think that's going to be their downfall eventually this year. I absolutely 100% agree, Scott. Yeah. You see how much we don't uh, think about Nick Polino. We didn't even mention him. <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> 7.6 over two years he got. Now, uh, I would, I would take that to be a, and a basically a plastic player. Yeah. <laughs> he, he needs to bounce back and he needs to be a factor. <laughs> yeah. But uh, apparently we don't think he will be because we didn't mention it. <laughs> Jim Montgomery does because Jim Montgomery thinks he's going to be the igniter of the bottom six, but for 3.8 million, I think uh, you could give out that money in different places to find that. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. 100%. In my opinion, anyway. <laughs> well, you wrote the piece on it, so your opinion is pretty valid. So, yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, well, thanks, Scott, for coming on the show and uh, talking about the Bruins as we get into pretty close to the season. We're getting, well, we even record this. Uh, it's a month uh, before the season starts. So, we're getting there. Uh, Hockey is just around the corner. Preseason is, um, again, depending on when you're watching this, uh, it could be already happening. But uh, thanks, for, thanks for coming on the show. Thank you guys for having me. It was a blast. Absolutely. All right. Thanks. Yeah. Well, that, that, there's another preview done. Uh, we're about halfway through the, the teams now. So thanks for joining us for another uh, preview show at the Hockey Writers Podcast. And uh, we'll be pumping them out uh, one a day as we keep going here and hopefully get through all the teams by, by the time the season starts. And um, yeah, well, thanks for watching. And uh, check out the Morning Skate newsletter. It comes out three days a week. It'll be coming back to five once the season starts check out our uh, our quick fire with the hockey writers youtube series we're getting going here too we've got a couple out there I have a panel of writers that just come on and just answer quick fire questions they don't know what the questions are when they come on so uh, it's a fun <laughs> time to watch it's only like five to eight minute long videos so check those out they're great uh, as the season goes and they'll be going out throughout the season uh, to definitely check those out too Thanks for joining us, and we'll see you next time on another uh, Hot Rush Podcast season preview.